two-year history of progressive. Thank you for the recording. She had a two-year history of progressive memory decline and cognitive issues and was seen by her PCP who ordered a CT head on October 11th and the CT head showed, sorry, the CT head showed concern for a large basilar tip aneurysm and she was subsequently referred to Dr. Miller and went an evaluation with the CTA. The past medical history was relevant for anxiety, depression. Um, in terms of risk factors for aneurysm, she was hypertensive. Uh, she was a fairly substantial smoker. She'd been smoking approximately two packs of cigarettes a day since she was 16. She didn't have any family, no known family history of either subarachnoid hemorrhage or uh, any known history of cerebral aneurysms in her first degree relatives. Otherwise, her surgical history was remarkable and she was taking levothyroxine for her hypothyroidism. Her examination was also unremarkable. Um, GCS15 intact without any cranial nerve palsies. So this is a CT. This is a non-contrast CT of her head, which shows an isodense lesion in the inter interpeduncular cistern, extending fairly substantially um, above the cella there. And this was on the 11th that the CT head was obtained by her PCP. Like I said, she went evaluation subsequently with the CTA of her head, also performed by the PCP, and it demonstrates um, approximately 1.5 centimeter basilar tip aneurysm with both the P1 segments arising from the dome itself, as well as the left superior cerebral artery, which you can appreciate on the coronal here. Hey, on the- Christian, it's uh, Dr. Graywall. You said her presentation was cognitive decline? Yes. So can you pause it why you think that could potentially be true versus was this incidentally found on a scan? Mm, I wonder if the mass effect from the aneurysm pushing on uh, either medial temporal lobe, parahippocampal gyrus may have caused cognitive de decline. Go, go back to your CT, the non-con. Yep. Do you see anything near the parahippocampal? No, not particularly. Okay. But... On that second slice, what do you see? On the second slice. On the on the one on the right, yeah. You see the yeah. aneurysm. What's it touching? Uh, it looks like it's extending towards the mammary bodies. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So remember, it's a full circuit. All right, anyway, sure. keep going. So this is the um, sagittal that shows the relationship of the neck and the dome to the cella. And you can see that the neck is approximately at the midpoint of the cella. And you can appreciate a little bit on the coronals, maybe not in these cuts, the relationship of the neck to the posterior clinoid. Like I said, um, both the P1 segments were originating from the neck as well as the left superior cerebral artery. She, this is uh, just more cuts just to show the relationship with the posterior clinoids there. And uh, I don't know if you can appreciate her PCOMs here, but though she didn't have large, large booming PCOMs, she did have PCOMs bilaterally and maybe a little bit of hypoplastic PCOM on the right there, right there. Once again, you can see the um, large extension of the aneurysm dome superiorly. So she subsequent, subsequently went evaluation with the uh, diagnostic angiogram with Dr. Miller. So this was performed on October 20th. And this is a left vert injection, uh, AP and lateral. And this better redemonstrates some of the neck morphology as well as the origin of the P1s bilaterally and the SCA coming from the aneurysm itself. <laughs> And the 3D reconstruction allows us to appreciate some of the neck morphology as well. And so you can see a dysplastic vessel uh, extending up and then the large dome with um, the P1s extending out there and the SEA there. Um, you measured this, I guess this was just over 1.5 centimeters, 17 millimeters here. Dr. Miller, did you have anything else? 
No, I think your uh, your uh, presentation was was good. I think uh, Dr. Graywall's point about the mammary bodies is a good one. Um, the other thing, though, with her is, is that when she actually came to the office, um, uh, she also complained of headache. And when you asked her about her headache, um, she said she never really gets headaches. But the last three or four weeks, she has had headaches. Now, she's a smoker and she's hypertensive. But if you really drill down on her headache history, it's kind of recent, more so than than. And but but her her main uh, her main complaint when she went to uh, the uh, the neurologist was uh, the memory decline. So, at this point. Um, given the location and the size of the aneurysm, the decision was made to admit the patient for consideration of intervention. The options at this point were observation, which was not really considered given the size and the morbidity associated with the rupture at this location of this aneurysm. Uh, the other two broad options considered were endovascular and microsurgical options. Microsurgically, this would have been a difficult aneurysm to approach um, probably would have required a subtemporal approach given the relationship to the cell in the posterior clinoid and the complex neck morphology would mean the risk of palamic perforators, especially anteriorly, would be high. And so the morbidity associated with the surgical approach was deemed unacceptably high and endovascular options were considered. As you can see, the neck is relatively broad, so straight coiling would likely not work in this case and would need, this aneurysm would need some sort of neck reconstruction. In terms of stent coiling options for neck reconstruction, options considered were either the Y stent technique or T stent technique even, where the stents were, stents are placed going out into the bilateral P1s. However, this would risk, as you can see, due to the fact that the P1s are emanating from the aneurysm itself, this would risk jailing some of the thalamic perforators going out posteriorly as well. Um, the other two options that were considered for remodeling were use of the pulse rider device, which is a scaffold device that allows, co allows um, coils to be more effectively de deployed into the aneurysm by, um, by its performance as a scaffold. Uh, alternatively, use of a balloon for a system, again, similarly in a scaffolding technique. Flow diversion in this case would also have had similar complications to the Y stenting where um, there's a risk for jailing of some of the small perforating vessels with flow diversion placed at this location, um, particularly given the fact that, like I said, both those vessels emanated from the dome itself. And additionally, though the web device can be considered, it's a the web is an intrasacular device, can be considered for certain aneurysms in this location, this aneurysm, given its size, was likely not a candidate for a web placement. So some of the risks of this procedure, this is general risk of really any endovascular coil embolization of an intracranial aneurysm. The decision was made to proceed with pulse rider assisted coiling of this, this complex basilar tip aneurysm. And so the, um, in terms of the devices used, I'll get into the operative video shortly, but uh, we used a six front sheet exchange for a long sheet, the Fabuki, and got up with a Bernstein and then used a Sophia intermediate catheter and initially a headway duo, I believe, and an SL10 prowler for the coiling catheters. And the neck was reconstructed, like I said, with the pulse rider device, which you'll see, and with several coils that were allowed to be placed through um, using the pulse rider as a scaffold. I'll just switch to the operative video now. I'm going to stop sharing this for a second. Recording. So this is just the unsubtracted view. Oops, let me just go back to that. So here you can see, um, here you can see our in, initial triaxial system heading up, um, coming up from the left vert there.
And then here you can see the pulse rider device right there with the proximal and distal markers right parked at the neck. And so shortly, the, so the pusher wire was kept on the pulse rider and then coils were then placed going through the pulse rider. This is just the same view laterally. And so here's the first of the coils that were deployed through. So originally the pulse rider was placed going on to the P1. And as the coils were started to de being deployed within the dome, then this allowed the scaffold to come back within the basilar trunk itself and allowed the coils to effectively be placed within the dome superiorly and posteriorly. And so here's that area of coiling continuing. And this is a run after approximately halfway through and you can see already stasis within the dome itself. And at this point, there's still patency of both the P1s and the SCA that's, that are emanating from the dome. So this was continued. And here is close to the end of our coiling procedure where you can see on the unsubtracted view there, let me just go back to that. You can see the pulse rider device there. So this is where it was parked into the P1 segment. So that's the distal marker and the proximal marker there and the coil mass within the dome. And this is the final run following this. And you can see quite a nice result with the very trace residual at the neck right here, but otherwise a nice impact, nice compaction of the coil mass there and patency of the bilateral P1s in the left SCA. I'm just gonna stop sharing this and go back to the PowerPoint for a sec. So these are some roadmap views and sub unsubtracted views that just show the positioning of the pulse rider, show how it was placed more distally. And now as the coils were deployed, um, it came back within the more proximal portion of the basilar and allowed further coils to be deployed near the neck. And you can see on that, uh, on that view, on the, on the image on the left, there are four dots which sort of defines the pulse rider. It looks a little bit like a tulip when it opens, has two sort of uh, triangular shaped arms that go out uh, on either side. And it's designed to sit, uh, the, the, the little part in the basilar there is, is a little, um, almost like a little stalk that keeps the, uh, the pulse rider in place. And you, what you, you can tell where the device is by those four dots. Uh, and, and, and on the image on the left, the, the, you can see that the one dot is out in the PCA and that's, you know, it's kind of ideal, we can talk a little more about it, but it's kind of ideal to have it sit at the, at the uh, just outside the aneurysm at the vessel that's, uh, that you want to keep open. And then uh, uh, over to the right-hand side, which is the left side of the patient, the dots are still in the, an in the aneurysm sac and they really haven't settled down. They're almost at that PCA, which you can barely see coming out. The vessel you see here is the SCA, but there's another PCA up by that last dot. Just, yeah, right there. That, that it's not quite in there, uh, but when you when you go to the, the the image on the right, that dot you can see that that last dot on the right is now down to the edge of the aneurysm, and that is actually in the left PCA there. Um, so that you've now by the coils have actually pushed the pulse rider down a little bit, allowing a more complete uh, filling of the aneurysm. But we can still see contrast. That both PCAs stayed open. It actually worked quite well in this particular case. These are those final runs again, just showing the end result, which um, shows, like I said, a very trace residual at the neck there, but otherwise it's quite a satisfactory result for the overall exclusion of the aneurysm angiographically. Um, immediately postoperatively, the patient did well. 
She was discharged post op day two after a stay in the ICU overnight and post op day one with no new neurological deficits at her baseline exam. And she was continued on aspirin 325 and 5x75 at discharge. The patient did represent back to the emergency department with headache on post operative day five, I believe. And so an MRA was obtained at this point. Here you can see the coil mass here, uh, coil mass here. And like I said, with the contrast administration, small residual neck of the filling into the aneurysm there, but otherwise no new changes were noted. And the patient was subsequently discharged again with plan for follow-up with Dr. Miller. This is just a side on the broad treatment of wide neck basal apex aneurysm. This was a complex basal apex given its size and given the fact that critical vessels were emanating from the dome, namely the bilateral P1s and the left SCA. And so the relationship of the, of the neck to the posterior clinoid as well for proximal control meant that the terional or an OZ approach was probably not sufficient to gain proximal control and really need to get subtemporal. Um, in terms of endovascular options for neck reconstruction, the pulse rider in this case was effectively used as a scaffold. Um, other options that could have been considered, like I said, were the Y stenting technique, but may have been more difficult to place given the fact that that left P1 and left SCA were very close in origin and emanating from the dome. Um, these are just some literature that's discussing and this is a relatively recent paper on the use of flow diverters in the posterior circulation and particularly in the basal apex. They've been used in a couple of different centers. So this study is from a combination of groups in Italy, University of Toronto, Yale, and uh, Boston, I believe. Um, not many patients. Uh, this was a series of 16. The one on the left was a series of 16 patients and they did have one death after a patient had a um, um, SCA P1 stroke. In terms of use of Y stenting versus the pulse rider, um, pulse rider, though it's been, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Mann, but I believe it's been in use for about four years or five years. Is that correct? Yeah, it's about, it's, it's, it's in that range. Um, so we don't necessarily have very long term angiographic follow up on a series of patients treated with this. Immediately, and at least in the immediate and six-month angiographic follow-up, the occlusion rates do appear to be in the low 90s, high 80s with both the Y stenting and the pulse rider techniques. Uh, and then this is the um, one-year follow-up. This is from a couple of years ago in AJNR. This was the, the study that looked at um, the pulse rider. This was the ANSWER trial, and they published their one-year follow-up uh, angiographic results. In this study, however, this study was not just for basal apex. They used the pulse rate in a variety of wide neck aneurysms. Their one-year angiographic occlusion rates were in the mid 60s, 67%. That's all I had, thank you. I think that's an excellent uh, presentation. And I, I think there were a couple of things with this, uh, with this case that are worth noting and, and, and taking lessons from. One, I think the most uh, the most significant thing is just the uh, the the demonstration of the the breadth of technologies that are now available. You know, we we see these conferences every week where where new and different things are are being uh, um, developed and deployed. Um, the pulse rider is is another uh, uh, you know kind of quiver uh, arrow in the quiver. You know, it, it, this um, in some ways you may have preferred to use a stent across this aneurysm or a stent through a stent. Uh, I mean, the, the big thing to recognize here is that the, the whole, that whole basilar tip is sick. Um, unfortunately, just no matter what we do uh, with endosacular treatment, um, this aneurysm has a, a chance of growing, um, partly because that whole neck where both, where all of the vessels come off the PCAs and the SCAs, uh, you can see in this particular case, uh, some of them incorporated into the aneurysm itself. So that whole area is sick. Uh, and so it's gonna be very difficult uh, in this location when, when we see recurrences. But um, it, it would have been very difficult to place a stent into either of these PCAs. Uh, you, you just don't know what the, uh, 
what what uh, what the the wall of those arteries look like. You know that there are so many aneurysms. I think it would have been much more dangerous, even if you could have gotten the the stents to open and stay open. The pulse rider allowed you to allowed us to reconstruct the neck without losing either of those vessels. Um, you know, and, and, and Dr. Wessel, you're on. You you can talk a little bit about the. Uh, surgical approaches for an aneurysm in this location? Do we still have them? We lost them. Okay, yeah, well, I'm here, just trying to un unmute. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I mean, uh, I think we all understand how the treatment of basilar uh, apex aneurysms has evolved over time to uh, you know, become somewhat less morbid, but traditional surgical approaches in general would involve um, either a subtemporal approach or um, uh, more of an anterior lateral approach uh, through a terional craniotomy. Um, most of these result in a third nerve palsy that often resolves, but the big concern with the basilar aneurysms pertains to the perforators in that region. Um, this aneurysm in particular would have been incredibly challenging, obviously, due to its size and very large and um, would be uh, abutting a bunch of perforators likely along the backside of the aneurysm dome, feeding the brainstem. So to be able to safely clip that and preserve those perforators would be uh, a likely impossible feat. But... Yeah, no, and... And that there's certainly the the the, the posterior circulation the aneurysms, particularly the basilars, are, are have, were one of the early ones recognized by everybody as a as a real opportunity for endovascular treatment. Flow diversion obviously is a, is a, a um, you know the, the technique that everybody likes to employ and we like to employ. We've had great results with it, but the problem uh, uh, with that in the posterior circulation is it's not that you can't do it, but there is a much higher rate of stroke and complication. Uh, related to um, the perforators, just as Dr. Wessels uh, alluded to. In general, vessels that, that are uh, on, on the vessels that go away from the areas that are covered with a flow diverter should theoretically stay open um, because there, there's continued flow. And as long as there's demand, usually those vessels stay open, but the perforators don't always stay open. And small vessels can be can be lost. That's a problem in the anterior circulation, but it's a, a big problem uh, in the posterior circulation, particularly in vessels like the basilar, where there are very, very uh, a great number of small perforators. So the flow diverter, while it's a you know it has tremendous advantages as far as helping to reconstruct the vessel and and allowing true healing, uh, are still a real problem in the posterior circulation. So that's. That was one reason that we chose not to do it. The other reason that I think we chose to, to go endosacular with our treatment here was because of the patient's history of recent headaches. Um, you know, uh, this is an unruptured aneurysm. However, I think that the, the, and one of the reasons we admitted the patient straight off was our concern that somebody who comes up with new headaches and has an aneurysm like this, I don't think you can sort of, you have to have a, a, a very strong suspicion that uh, the aneurysm is changing and that the aneurysm is responsible for the headaches. She does have, you know, she is a smoker. She does have hypertension. She does have other reasons, but she really didn't have a, a, a strong history of headache and the headaches were pretty bothersome to her by the time she got to our office. Um, and then there's the, uh, Dr. Lee, I can see you here. I, um, any thoughts as to why I brought the patient back very quickly in uh, four or five days and brought her into the emergency room and got not only a CT scan, but an MRI, uh, an MRI and an MR angiogram? 